Hello everyone and thanks for watching Edupedia World Videos. In this video we learn about the final two properties of light when they are treated as waves, polarization and scattering. Now we've seen polarization before when we talked about transverse waves on a string but we didn't talk about it in terms of sound waves and that is because polarization of waves is a process, is a phenomena that happens only for transverse waves. So that's what we'll study first, polarization. Now I said that it is available only for transverse waves and we are studying it for light waves. That should mean that light is a transverse wave. Now when light travels from point A to point B, there is something that must be changing with space and time because that is the definition of a wave. What is changing in the case of light is the direction of electric field. Actually, it's the direction of magnetic field as well and we've seen that before, I won't go into that again. The magnetic field is perpendicular to both the electric field and the direction of propagation. Right, right now we'll just talk about the electric field and the electric field probably would go something like this. Right, so the electric field would vary in a sinusoidal way. Now, if light is traveling in the positive x direction, then that does not necessarily mean that the electric field is in the y direction. It can actually be anywhere within the yz plane. All we know is that the electric field will be perpendicular to the direction of propagation. But the y direction is perpendicular to x, z direction is perpendicular to x. In fact, any direction in the yz plane is perpendicular to the x direction. And that is what polarization tells us. Polarization tells us that we already know it's perpendicular to the x direction, but what is the actual direction? Is it y, z or somewhere in between? So we could have chosen polarization to be the direction of electric field or magnetic field. It just so happens that we chose to define the polarization vector for a light wave as the direction of the electric field. Right. And another thing, we won't, when we talk about polarization, distinguish between up and down or plus and minus. A polarization in the y direction means the electric field is sometimes in the positive y direction, sometimes in the negative y direction. A polarization in the z direction means that the electric field is both positive and negative but always pointing towards the z direction. Right. So if we take a random light wave, it can be written as E is equal to E naught sine omega t minus kx. And it would have a direction in the yz plane. Since we have written omega t minus kx, we've already told that it's traveling along the x direction. So the electric field has to be in the yz plane. It can either be in the y direction or in the z direction or somewhere in between. So what we'll do is we'll separate the electric field into two components, the component along the y and the component along the z axis. And the superposition or the sum of those two components would give the net electric field. So let's say whatever a hat vector, it is a unit vector along the direction of electric field, right? So let's just say this is composed of two waves, EY is equal to E1 sine of omega t minus kx plus delta 1. They will always be have some phase difference, right? E2 sine omega t minus kx plus delta 2. Now the first is E y is along the y direction, so j hat, E z is along the z direction, so k hat, but we are only talking about magnitudes right now, we will not worry about the direction at all, right? We have already written E y, so it tells us that it's in the y direction, this tells us it's in the z direction. And another thing, when we've done this in terms of SHMs and vectors also, when we are talking about adding two things which have a phase difference, that we can always choose any one of them to have a phase of zero. So let's take the first to be E1 sin omega t minus kx. Let's take the second one to be E2 sin omega t minus kx plus delta. Right. So this is Ey and this is Ez. Now, if E1 is 0, in that case, and E2 is non-zero, in that case, the polarization is completely along the z direction because you never see any electric field in the y direction because the component of electric field in the y direction is 0. If E2 is 0, and E1 is non-zero. In that case, the polarization is along the y direction because the component along the z direction is zero. Right. Now, these two tell us that if we are looking at this direction, this is the y axis, this is the z axis. Let's say this is EY, this is EZ, and we add them up. This is total E. Then, EZ by EY is the angle made with the y-axis, the tan of the angle made with the y-axis, right? What is that equal to? 
So we have E y is equal to E1 sin omega t minus kx. This is the y direction, this is the z direction. Right? Actually, you know, it will be better to keep this z direction and this the y direction. Because what will happen in that case is y cross z, which should be x, will point away from the viewer, which is the direction we're assuming that the wave is propagating in inside the plane. Right. So E y is even sine omega t minus k x. E z is E2 sine omega t minus k x plus delta. Right. So this is E y, this is E z, this will be net E. This will be the component of E y, this will be the component of E z. Let's take this angle to be theta. In that case, tan theta or tan of the angle between the polarization vector and the z axis would be equal to E y by E z or E1 sine omega t minus kx plus delta. Right. Now we've already talked about the simple cases. If E1 is 0, then polarization is along the z axis. If E2 is 0, then the polarization is along the y axis. If delta, then now let's talk about the other cases. If delta is a function of time, that means the phase difference between these two is changing with time. It is not constant in time. We've seen this before. If two sources have the phase difference which is constant in time, they are called coherent sources. And if they have a phase difference which is not constant in time, they are incoherent sources. So in this case, the y and z components of electric field will be incoherent and they'll add up not to give any direction. It'll be just a random direction of polarization because sometimes it'll be here, sometimes it'll be here, sometimes it'll be here. And this light is called unpolarized light. Unpolarized light just means that if the light is traveling along the x-axis, then at any point, at any time, it, the electric field could be in the y direction, z direction, or anywhere in between. It does not have a fixed value. It is unpolarized. Right. Let's say delta is equal to 0 or pi. In that case, if delta is equal to 0, that will give me tan theta is equal to E1 by E2, or theta is equal to tan inverse E1 by E2. And if the delta is pi, in that case, this will be in the negative of this, and theta will be tan inverse of minus E1 by E2. In both cases, we see that theta is a constant. It does not depend on x or on t. It does not depend on the position or the time. If theta is a constant, that means the electric field vector makes a constant angle with the z-axis or with the y-axis. Such light is called linearly polarized light. Linearly polarized, as the name suggests, means the electric field is along a constant direction. If the light is traveling in the x direction, either the electric field will always be in the y direction, positive or negative, or always be in the z direction, or let's say always be at an angle of 30 degrees with the z axis in the yz plane, but it will be fixed. It will not change with x or t. Such light is called linearly polarized light. Now the interesting cases are, I'm just going to rub this at the top because we don't need this anymore. This third formula is all that's important now. So another case, an interesting one, would be if delta is equal to pi by 2. If delta is equal to pi by 2, then this will be sine omega t minus kx. This will be cos of omega t minus kx. And that will become tan of omega t minus kx. Now if delta is equal to pi by 2, that means at some points, this term will be 1 and this term will be 0. At other points, this term will be 1, this term will be 0. Right. So there will be some points when the electric field will be along the z direction. A little while later, it will be along the y direction. It will actually be shifting and such a light is called elliptically polarized light. And the reason it's called elliptically polarized light is because the polarization would go something like this. Let's say delta is pi by 2 and initially sine of omega t minus kx is 0. That means cos of omega t minus kx is 1 and in that case theta will be 0 and the electric field will be in this direction. A little while later the electric field will be in this direction. 
then this direction, then this direction. When this term omega t minus kx, when this becomes pi by 2, then E1 will have 1 and E2 will have cos of it which will be 0. So, the electric field will be along the y direction. right? So, the electric field will actually keep rotating like this. This is E2 or Ez maximum. This is E1 or Ey maximum. Right. So, the electric field, then it will be like this, then it will be like this. Right. So, the electric field will keep on rotating. Right. And this is called elliptically polarized light. Even in this case, the electric field is not constant. At some points, it is a magnitude of E2 and points in the Z direction. At other points, it has a magnitude of E1 and points in the Y direction. At other points, it makes an angle of 30 degrees with the Z axis. And a specific subset of this is if delta is equal to pi by 2 and E1 is equal to E2. In that case, it will be something like this, where it will keep going like this, and then it is called, you can already guess it, circularly polarized light. So, unpolarized light, when the phase difference is not constant in time. If the phase difference is 0 or pi, that means the direction of electric field will always stay a constant. That is called linearly polarized light. It could be in the x direction, y direction, or anywhere in between. If delta is something in between pi by 2 and pi, it's not in our course. But you, if you want, you can try it mathematically. It's not that hard, actually. If delta is pi by 2, it is an elliptically polarized light. And if delta is pi by 2 and E1 is equal to E2, it's circularly polarized light. Right. So these are the examples of different types of polarization of light. Now, what is the use of this? We can actually filter light for particular polarizations by passing them through a polarizer. So, for example, there might be polarizations, polarizers which have a transmission axis which would be the z-axis or the y-axis. If the transmission axis for the polarizer is the z-axis, that means it will only allow electric field in the z-direction to pass through. So, if you have, let's say, elliptically polarized light and you pass it through a polarizer, then what will come out and the polarization transmission axis is, let's say, this direction, making an angle of 45 degrees with the z-axis. Then the light that will come out will be linearly polarized, and the direction of polarization will be the same as what is passed through this polarizer. Right. So you could take circularly polarized light, elliptically polarized light, or unpolarized light, and you pass them through a linear polarizer, and you would end up getting a linearly polarized light, which would have the polarization the same as the transmission axis of the polarizer. right? You could also take one linearly polarized light and pass it through a polarizer. If the linearly polarized light has a polarization in the y-axis and you pass it through a polarizer whose transmission axis is the y-axis, then it will just not be obstructed at all and it will completely come out. If, however, you pass it through a polarizer which has a transmission axis as the z-axis, then you will have not any light passing through. Because the only light that can pass through is light which has a polarization in the z-axis or any component of electric field in the z-axis, but a linearly polarized light in the y-direction will not have any component. What would happen if, let's say, you take a light which is polarized at 45 degrees to the z-axis and you pass it through a polarizer that has a transmission axis equal to the z-axis. In that case, some of the light will pass through, but not all of it will pass through. And the intensity is derived experimentally and given by Malice's law, which simply says that the intensity coming out of a polarizer is equal to the original intensity times cos square theta, where theta is the angle between the initial linearly polarized light and the transmission axis of the polarizer. Right. You can always think of this as a rope vibrating, and if a rope is vibrating in the y direction, and you pass it through a filter which only has a slit in the z direction, then nothing will be able to go through. But if the slit is in the y direction, then everything will be able to go through. And if the slit makes an angle with the z axis, then some of it will go through, but not all of it. Right. Another important aspect of polarization is how it affects and manifests itself in refraction of light. Now, we will study refraction in detail after this video when we start geometrical optics. But I know that you have sufficient understanding of refraction in 9th and 10th class to understand what I am telling you right now. So, the simple case of light entering a medium, some of it getting reflected and some other part of it getting refracted. 
right when light passes through from one medium to another it gets refracted refracted sometimes even absorbed or scattered right so this is the normal let's say this is i which is equal to r let's say this is t the transmission angle or refraction and refraction both begin with r so i'll use it as the transmission angle now what generally happens when light passes through when light goes from one medium to another in refraction is that different polarizations have tendency to either be strongly reflected or strongly refracted so if this is the direction of propagation of the light ray in that case the plane perpendicular to this will have the polarization right so it could be either shown like this a component of it would be inside the plane of your monitor but perpendicular to the ray of propagation and a component of electric field could be like this going inside and coming outside right what happens with reflected rays is that reflected rays tend to have a polarization perpendicular to the plane of reflection so if you have a random polarization like this then perpendicular to the plane of reflection you'll have strongly polarized light some of it will be polarized in the plane of reflection but when you have a refracted ray the plane of the polarization which is in the plane of refraction that tends to be strongly transmitted right so this is how we we'll show this i'll repeat it again because i think i said something which might not be correct if you take light which is polarized both in the plane of refraction and perpendicular to the plane of refraction then the light polarized perpendicular to the plane of refraction has a tendency to be reflected and the light polarized in the plane of refraction has a strong tendency to be transmitted at a particular angle which is called brewster's angle this is an angle of incidence at a particular angle of incidence the reflected ray is completely polarized perpendicular to the plane of refraction so this particular ray does not have any polarization in the plane of refraction the refracted ray will always have some polarization either way but if the incident angle is the brewster's angle then the reflected ray is always polarized completely perpendicular to the plane of refraction and this angle is given by tan inverse of mu we've seen sin inverse of mu that represents the critical angle that represents the angle for which total internal refraction would take place tan inverse mu is an incident angle i'm assuming light goes from 1 to mu tan inverse mu is the incident angle and if this angle is incident then the reflected ray would not have any polarization in the plane of refraction it would have complete polarization perpendicular to the plane of refraction now what is the use of this there are certain sunglasses which just absorb the intensity and reduce it but there are other sunglasses which are special you've heard probably polaroid sunglasses and they are made up of polarizers which can differentiate between light in the plane of your spectacle glasses and perpendicular to it and the reason those are important is because those glasses are specifically designed so that these rays which are reflected do not pass through those lights So what we do not want is glare coming from the road or sunlight reflected from buildings entering into the eyes. So the polarization tra the transmission axis of the polarization within those spectacles is such that light that is reflected is much reduced in intensity however light that comes straight across or is transmitted is not greatly reduced in intensity. This is different from a standard sunglass which reduces the intensity of any light falling on it. Okay one small thing left the plane containing the electric field and the direction of propagation is called the plane of polarization so let's say if the light is propagating along the x axis and the polarization is along the y direction then the xy plane would be the plane of propagation the final topic that is left for waves is the scattering of light and we see this whenever light passes through any medium which is not a vacuum for example a gas or a liquid specifically gases uh, what happens is whenever a light beam passes through a gas let's say this is a parallel light beam passing through a box of gas then it will come out in all random directions a major portion of it might go through but it will also come out in all random directions Right. now this is not diffraction this is not happening because of obstruction this is actually a process called scattering and in scattering what happens is molecules of the gas will absorb the light will absorb a photon 
will increase its energy state. We'll see all this in detail later when we move on to modern physics, which will be the last unit for 12th class course. But molecules absorb energy from light, increase their internal energy, then reduce their internal energy by emitting light. So what happens is these are, let's say, the two states of atoms in which the electron can stay in a lower state or a higher state. If it's in a lower state, it will absorb a photon and move to the higher state. Once it's at a higher state, it has a certain lifetime after which it will decay and it will move back to the lower state emitting a photon. Now the emitted photon is not necessarily in the direction of the absorbed photon and that's why light is absorbed by the molecules and then scattered in all different directions. This process is called scattering of light. Right. Now it also has many uses. One of the most fun ones in my opinion is if you ever gone to see a laser show what happens before any laser show is that they burst firecrackers or suspend some sort of particles in the air. That's because the only way you'll be able to see lasers in the air if those lasers are scattered by those particles and reach your eye. If light is traveling from point A to point B and you're looking at it from here, you would be able to see nothing. You would be able to see darkness because no light is actually entering your eye. Light is going from A to B. For you to be able to see light, light has to enter your eye. However, if there are a lot of particles here, let's say dust particles, suit, silt, whatever, then those particles will absorb some light and scatter it in different directions, which will make you able to see light. So that's why, and you can see this by yourself, if you just shine a laser in pretty empty air, clear air, you won't be able to see the laser light in the air. But if you shine it through fog or through a smoky area, you'll actually be able to see the laser light in the air because it will be scattered by those particles and reach your eyesight. Another reason for this, another example of this rather is the color of the sky which we see is blue and that is because longer wavelengths tend to be scattered more than shorter wavelengths. Blue is scattered more and or the way I always remember it is red is scattered less. And because of the fact that red is scattered less, first of all you can derive from it whether high frequency or low frequency is scattered more. But because red is scattered less, we use red light and traffic lights. Because red is the light which you'll be able to see from the greatest distance if you're traveling in a fog. Green scatters more than red, blue scatters more than red. Any light scatters more than red because red has the lowest frequency and the highest wavelength of all lights. Now there is a particular law which quantitatively defines how much scattering there is and that is the Rayleigh law of scattering and it says that scattering is proportional to one by lambda to the power four. Right. So as lambda increases, scattering decreases. That's why red light is scattered the least and blue light is scattered the most. When light is traveling from the sun to our atmosphere, it is scattered by our atmosphere and blue light is scattered the most. Red light is scattered the least. That's why we look at the sky and we see it as blue. Right. Also, whenever you see a sky at sunset or sunrise, it looks red. And the reason for that is it actually has to travel a much greater distance in the atmosphere as compared to when rays are coming directly. And when it has to travel a much greater in this distance in the atmosphere, then the easily scattered portion of the spectrum, such as violet and blue and indigo, they are scattered completely and you're not able to see them at all. And you're able to see the only the lowly scattered wavelengths and that is red. So normal sky appears blue because blue is most scattered. At sunrise and sunset, it appears red because scattering is already done because it travels a lot of distance and you're only able to see what is left, which is a reddish orange sort of thing. This completes wave properties of light. In the next video, we'll start the particle properties of light and then we'll move on to geometrical optics, which you'll see as very familiar to something you've already seen before. We'll see the mirror formula, the lens formula, the refraction at spherical surfaces and so on. Thank you.